ಇಂದಿನ ಅತಿಥಿ ಮೈಸೂರು ವಿಶ್ವವಿದ್ಯಾಲಯದ ಪ್ರಾಧ್ಯಾಪಕರಾಗಿರುವ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಕೆ ಕೆಂಪರಾಜು ಅವರು ಇಂದು ವಿಷ ಜಂತುಗಳು ಶಾಪವೋ ವರವು ವೆನಮಸ್ ಆರ್ಗ್ಯಾನಿಸಮ್ ಬೂನ್ ಆರ್ ಪೇನ್ ಎಂಬ ವಿಷಯದ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಭಾಷಣ ನೀಡಲಿದ್ದಾರೆ ನಮ್ಮ ಅತಿಥಿ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಕೆ ಕೆಂಪರಾಜು ಅವರ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಒಂದು ಸಣ್ಣ ಪರಿಚಯ ಇವರು ಎಂಎಸ್ಸಿ ಪಿಎಚ್ಡಿ ಪದವಿಗಳನ್ನು ಬಯೋಕೆಮಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ಮೈಸೂರು ವಿಶ್ವವಿದ್ಯಾಲಯಗಳಿಂದ ವಿಶ್ವವಿದ್ಯಾಲಯದಿಂದ ಗಳಿಸಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಬಯೋ ಬಯೋಕೆಮಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿಯ ಪಿಎಚ್ ಡಿ ವಿದ್ಯಾರ್ಥಿಯಾಗಿ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಸೈನ್ಸ್ ನಲ್ಲಿ ಕೂಡ ಕಾಲ ಕಳೆದಿದ್ದಾರೆ ನಂತರ ಪೋಸ್ಟ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಫೆಲೋಶಿಪ್ ಅನ್ನು ಆಲ್ಬರ್ಟ್ ಐನ್ಸ್ಟೈನ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೆಡಿಸಿನ್ ಯು ಎಸ್ ಎಂದ ಮಾಡಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಪ್ರಸ್ತುತವಾಗಿ ಬಯೋಕೆಮಿಸ್ಟ್ರಿಯ ಪ್ರಾಧ್ಯಾಪಕರಾಗಿ ಮೈಸೂರು ವಿಶ್ವವಿದ್ಯಾಲಯದಲ್ಲಿ ಕಾರ್ಯನಿರ್ವಹಿಸುತ್ತಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಇವರ ಸಂಶೋಧನೆಯ ವಿಷಯ ವೆನಮ್ ಫಾರ್ಮಕೋಡಾನಿಕ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ಕ್ಲೂಡಿಂಗ್ ದ ಎಫೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆನ್ ಇನ್ನೇಟ್ ಇನ್ಯೂಕ್ಸರ್ಸ್ ಟ್ರಾಂಬೋಸಿಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಹೆಮೋಟೋಸಿಸ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಾ ಸೆಲ್ಲಾರ್ ಮ್ಯಾಟ್ರಿಕ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಪ್ಲೇಟ್ಲೆಟ್ ಬಯಾಲಜಿ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಕೆಂಪರಾಜು ಅವರು ನೂರ ಹತ್ತಕ್ಕೂ ಹೆಚ್ಚು ಸಂಶೋಧನಾ ಲೇಖನಗಳನ್ನು ಪ್ರಕಟಿಸಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಇವರ ಸಂಶೋಧನಾ ವಿಷಯಗಳು ಖ್ಯಾತ ಜರ್ನಲ್ಗಳಾದ ನೇಚರ್ ಕಮ್ಯುನಿಕೇಶನ್ಸ್ ಜರ್ನಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಫೈನಲ್ ರಿಸರ್ಚ್ ಟ್ರೆಂಡ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಬಯೋಟೆಕ್ ಇತ್ಯಾದಿ ಇವುಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ಪ್ರಕಟವಾಗಿದೆ ಇವರು ಹದಿನೆಂಟಕ್ಕೂ ಹೆಚ್ಚು ವಿದ್ಯಾರ್ಥಿಗಳಿಗೆ ಪಿಎಚ್ ಡಿ ಪದವಿ ಗಳಿಸಲು ಮಾರ್ಗದರ್ಶನ ನೀಡಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಕೆಂಪರಾಜು ಅವರು ಸೊಸೈಟಿ ಆಫ್ ಬಯಾಲಜಿಕಲ್ ಕೆಮಿಸ್ಟ್ ಇಂಡಿಯಾ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಸೈನ್ಸ್ ಕಾಂಗ್ರೆಸ್ ಮತ್ತು ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಸೈನ್ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಸೊಸೈಟಿ ಆಫ್ ಅಥರೋಸ್ಕ್ಲೋರೋಸಿಸ್ ರಿಸರ್ಚ್ ನಲ್ಲಿ ಅಜೀವ ಸದಸ್ಯರಾಗಿ ಕಾರ್ಯನಿರ್ವಹಿಸುತ್ತಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಇವರು ಸತತವಾಗಿ ಸ್ನೇಕ್ ಬೆನಮ್ ಫಾರ್ಮಕೋಡಾನಮಿಕ್ಸ್ ಮತ್ತು ಪ್ಲೇಟ್ಲೆಟ್ ಬಯಾಲಜಿ ವಿಷಯಗಳ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಸಂಶೋಧನಾ ನಡೆಸ ಸಂಶೋಧನೆಗಳನ್ನು ನಡೆಸುತ್ತಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಇಂದು ವಿಷ ಜಂತುಗಳು ಶಾಪವೋ ವರವೋ ಮೆನುಮಸ್ ಆರ್ಗ್ಯಾನಿಸಮ್ಸ್ ಬೂನ್ ಆರ್ ಬೇನ್ ಎಂಬ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಭಾಷಣ ನೀಡುತ್ತಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಇಂದಿನ ಸೈನ್ಸ್ ಸಂಜೆಗೆ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಕೆ ಕೆಂಪರಾಜು ಅವರನ್ನು ನಾನು ಹೃತ್ಪೂರ್ವಕವಾಗಿ ಸ್ವಾಗತ ಕೋರುತ್ತೇನೆ ದಯಮಾಡಿ ಎಲ್ಲರೂ ತಮ್ಮ ಮೊಬೈಲ್ ಫೋನ್ಗಳನ್ನು ಸೈಲೆಂಟ್ ಅಥವಾ ಸ್ವಿಚ್ ಆಫ್ ಮಾಡಬೇಕೆಂದು ಹೇಳಿಕೊಳ್ಳುತ್ತೇನೆ ಧನ್ಯವಾದ ಎಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಕಳೆಗಳ ಸರ್ ಮಾಸ್ಟರ್ ನನಗೆ ಕರೆದಾಗ ಕರೆದು ನನಗೆ ಕನ್ನಡದಲ್ಲಿ ಮಾತನಾಡಿ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿದ್ರು ಆದ್ರೆ ನನ್ ನನ್ನ ಕಷ್ಟ ನಾವು ಜೊತೆಲಿ ಈಗ ಬರ್ಬೇಕಾದ್ರೆ ಮಾತನಾಡ್ದೆ ಏನಕ್ಕೆ ನನಗೆ ಕನ್ನಡದಲ್ಲಿ ಸೈಂಟಿಫಿಕ್ ಟಾಕ್ ನೋಡ್ಲಿಕ್ಕೆ ಆಗಲ್ಲ ಯಾಕೆಂತಂದ್ರೆ ಐ ಲರ್ನ್ ಮೈ ಎ ಬಿ ಸಿ ಡಿ ವೆನ್ ಐ ವಾಸ್ ಇನ್ ಸೆವೆಂತ್ ಸ್ಟ್ಯಾಂಡರ್ಡ್ ಟು ನಾಟ್ ಎ ಫಾರ್ ಆಪಲ್ ಬಿ ಫಾರ್ ಬಾಲ್ ಎ ಫಾರ್ ಸೇಬು ಬಿ ಫಾರ್ ಚೆಂಡು ಆ ರೀತಿ ಕಲ್ತ ಆನಂತರ ಏನೋ ಗೊತ್ತಿಲ್ಲ ಎಂಟನೇ ತರಗತಿಯಿಂದನೇ ನಾನು ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷ್ ಮೀಡಿಯಂ ತಗೋಬೇಕು ಅಂದ್ಬಿಟ್ಟು ಅರ್ಥ ಮಾಡ್ಕೊಂಡೆ ಸೊ ಎಂಟನೇ ತರಗತಿಯಿಂದ ನಮಗೆ ಸೈನ್ಸ್ ಟು ರಿಯಲ್ ಸೈನ್ಸ್ ಸಬ್ಜೆಕ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಆಗ್ತದೆ ಆ ಸಮಯದಲ್ಲಿ ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷ್ ಪ್ರೊಫಿಷಿಯನ್ಸಿ ಇಲ್ಲದೆ ಇರೋದ್ರಿಂದ ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷು ಸರಿಯಾಗಿ ಬರಲಿಲ್ಲ ಕನ್ನಡನೂ ಸರಿಯಾಗಿ ಬರಲಿಲ್ಲ ಬಟ್ ಇಲ್ಲಿವರೆಗೂ ಇಲ್ಲಿ ತನಕ ನಾವು ಸುಮಾರು ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷ್ ಇದರಲ್ಲೇ ನಾವು ಈ ಪಠ್ಯಪುಸ್ತಕಗಳನ್ನ ನಾವು ಓದಿರೋದ್ರಿಂದ ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷು ಕನ್ನಡಕ್ಕಿನ್ನ ಪರವಾಗಿಲ್ಲ ಅಂತ ಹಾಗಾಗಿ ನಾನು ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷ್ನಲ್ಲೇ ಭಾಷಣ ಮಾಡಬೇಕು ಅಂತ ಅಂದ್ಬಿಟ್ಟು ಸರ್ ನಿಮ್ಗೆ ಕೇಳ್ಕೊಂಡಾಗ ಪರವಾಗಿಲ್ಲ ನಾನು ಇಂಗ್ಲೀಷ್ ಅಲ್ಲೇ ಭಾಷಣ ಮಾಡಿ ಮತ್ ಮತ್ತೆ ಕನ್ನಡ ಪ್ರೈವೇಟ್ಸಿ ಅಂತ ತೆಗೆದು ಸೊ ಹಾಗಾಗಿ ಆಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಒನ್ ಪಾಸಿಬಲ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಐ ವಿಲ್ ಗೋ ವಿತ್ ಕನ್ನಡ ಅದರ್ವೈಸ್ ಐ ವಿಲ್ 
You know, my group at the Department of Biochemistry, University of Mysore, is working on different concepts of uh, snake venom pharmacodynamics. These are the different areas in which we are working with. It's uh, understanding the mechanism of why provides induced sustained tissue decay. Do you have a pointer? A pointer? No? Pointer. 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 No. And venom induced oxidative stress and hypoxia. Understanding the venom variability due to geographic distribution of snake species. Understanding venom neutralization strategies by anti venom and small molecules. And characterization of molecules of therapeutic importance from venoms. These are all technical statements, uh, scientific statements that you don't have to really worry very much. Anyway, for better clarity, better understanding, for further events. Let me uh, you know, give uh, a simplified version of these statements. Mechanism of viper bites induced sustained tissue decay means what it means is that many of the viper bites are known to induce uh, sustained tissue decay at the site of bite. At the site of bite, they induce tissue decay. That is, uh, that tissue decay is a long lasting one that may persist for a couple of days, couple of weeks, couple of months, couple of years, maybe like one year. So that's very similar to that of the diabetic agent. Neither the molecular mechanism is known, nor the remedy is available. My group is extensively working to understand the molecular mechanism and also find out the remedy for this. I'm extremely delighted to tell you the fact that quite recently, in the recent past, during 2016, we could be able to discover the molecular mechanism for the first time and also discover uh, the remedy, simple remedy for this. Am I made it clear? This is, this is the one. Second point, venom induced oxidative stress and hypoxia. Uh, if you just uh, Go back to your high school standard, high school classes, and remember, try to recall your uh, you know, definition of oxidation and reduction. Oxidation is nothing but addition of oxygen or removal of hydrogen. That's the definition we learn during high school standard. But the better way of you know, presentation of defining oxidation is removal of electrons with a concomitant loss of energy. This is most important. Removal of electrons with concomitant loss of energy. That means to say, venom or venom toxicity can push the system into an oxidative state, where oxidative state, state means lower energy state. Lower energy state. So, oxidative state leads to lower energy state. That means to say, See, whenever there is a snake bite, the snake bite would cause toxicity and induce oxidation. But predominantly, the oxygen transporting machinery is getting oxidized. Especially hemoglobin that is present in the red blood cells getting oxidized. As the hemoglobin is oxidized and becomes methemoglobin, methemoglobin loses its ability to transport oxygen. So, during a snake bite, the system is pushing towards oxidative stress. As a result, its oxygen transporting ability is slows down. So, oxygen is so important for our system. Our system being multi organ system, so organs, let's say heart, lungs, you know, brain, skeletal muscle, blood, they are all designed for a definite function. And, and they follow a different kind of physiology. Say, for example, brain is completely aerobic in nature. Completely aerobic. So, brain cannot sustain without oxygen even for a second. So, you just imagine during snake bite, if the system is pushing towards oxidative stress, hemoglobin is converted to methemoglobin, and methemoglobin is unable to transport oxygen, and our system is now depleted with oxygen. That is, a worst state 
that can reach to your work state where our brain can immediately digest after get up because brain although it accounts to maybe less than 1.5% of the total body weight something like weighs around 1.3 to 1.5 you know kg as compared to let's say total body weight let's say 100 kg body weight brain is about 1.5 or about 1.5 kg but the oxygen demand is something like it, it requires nearly 30 to 35% of oxygen that we need look at that its body weight is just its weight is about just less than 1.5% but the oxygen requirement demand is 30 to 35% whether something is depleted with oxygen or not brain cannot you know accept it whether you take it or not but i want my share always so in that case what happens is when during oxidative stress the system is pushing towards you know oxidative oxidative state and low you know oxygen you know, availability low oxygen availability means energy depletion because your system synthesizes more energy through aerobic respiration in presence of oxygen so when there is depletion of oxygen means there is depletion of energy so the first organ that is getting affected is brain that we have discovered in our lab that's another discovery from our lab okay i think i made it clear this part, this part second point the third point weather variability due to geographic distribution of snake species what it means is that if you take cobra cobra snake from karnataka region cobra snake from madras region cobra from let's say maharashtra region rajasthan region and elsewhere if you collect the venom and analyze the toxicity and composition they drastically vary with respect to their composition as well as toxicity this understanding of this venom variability has a greater significance clinically as well as pathologically so understanding venom variability is very important that we are doing in our laboratory did i make it clear venom variability venom neutralization strategies by anti venom and small molecules you know the only therapy available for snake bite treatment is the intravenous infusion of polyvalent antivenom polyvalent antivenom that's the only therapy available as of now to treat snake bite cases and as i already mentioned let's say the third point venom variability due to geographic distribution of snake species so if you take cobra venom from karnataka region cobra venom from tamil nadu region they would vary in their composition they would vary in their respect to their toxicity so in that case can we use the same anti venom for the tree is the same anti venom is is able to neutralize all you know cobra bites all throughout the country is it possible that is the idea and neutralization of venom that is inhibition of venom toxicity by small molecules so here we have the wisdom from our forefathers knowledge from our forefathers they would have treated them you know snake bite with just uh, plant extract a plant powder called as all those things that means to say medicinal plants do contain venom neutralizing components can we target you know can we isolate can we identify venom neutralizing components from the plant components that's what the fourth point is very clear for 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 point what is going the characterization the last one characterization of molecules of therapeutic importance for venom so this is very important because venom is a mixture of target specific toxins i will come to that little later so here because of the target specificity venom comes many of the venom components they can be directly used as drugs are the serve as prototypes a lead molecules to make better drug molecules i'll come to that you can ask me questions later so in this case what it means is that see let's say for example venom as i said is a depot of many many target specific toxin from the venom from the venom toxin many drugs have been synthesized that those are available in the market so those drugs definitely have improved the, the quality of our life i'll tell you little later okay am i made it clear these things so based on these things you can ask me any questions today or even while we discussing you can ask me questions so but my current talk is not based on any of these aspects it's not a technical talk instead 
it's going to be a general one. So that's the reason why I chose this topic, venomous organisms, boon or bane. Boon, you know, varano or sharpen. Is beneficial or harmful? Good or bad? Good or clear? That's all. So this is what the title of the topic is. So, you know, these are some of the well-known venomous organisms. We are all aware of them. Snakes, scorpions, spiders, bees, harnets, cold snakes, jellyfish, pufferfish, frogs, centipedes, ants, lizards, octopus. Many, many, many. I've just listed a couple of them. These are highly, highly dangerous because their bite or sting is deadly if you are unlucky. If you are unlucky, their bites are sting. Is deadly, definitely. Okay. So, see, thus, the these are the the venomous organisms, and uh, you know, uh, of all these, snakes are the most popular, most you know, beautiful venomous organisms. Okay. Uh, however. Snakes fascinated man, both in mythology as well as in real life, in different ways since ancient times, since time immemorial. They are the symbol of worship, symbol of glory, symbol of love, symbol of hate, symbol of prayer, so on and so forth. That means snakes are the symbol of both good and evil, both good and bad. Yes, if you play with snakes at a distance, definitely they are the symbol of worship you can worship them they are the symbol of glory symbol of love but imagine you are bitten by a venomous snake your eyes started drooping you cannot see properly and your throat is catching you cannot speak properly and your chest is heavy chest is catching you cannot take your breath properly and you also witness there is a bite here, you also witness your beautiful precious tissue of the skin started melting, started rotting. Now if you say snakes are the symbol of worship, will you really feel like worshipping them? Definitely not. You can't even go for, you know, Nagar Panchamina, but I have to You start hating snakes, is it not? This is what, but whatever may be, whether good or bad, venomous snakes are really, really precious to mankind human kind because they eject precious venom. The venom is so precious, so expensive, it is maybe 10 times, 20 times, 30 times expensive than very expensive, you know, precious metal, yellow metal, gold or white metal, platinum. Maybe market rate for one gram of gold costs you around maybe 5,500 to 6,000, I don't know exactly. 5,500 6 dollars, something like that. And platinum may be double than that. But one gram of cobra venom, let's say this is cobra, it would have been a pointer, it would have, would have been a better thing. I, I forgot to bring that. <laughs> so, cobra venom, one gram cobra venom costs you around 50,000 to 1 lakh. Second one, Echis carnatus venom, that is SAS scale viper venom. It costs you around 1 lakh to 2 lakh rupees, 1 gram. And that's the third one, Hypnole Hypnole Venom. It, it, for 1 gram, it costs you around 8 lakhs to 10 lakhs rupees. So expensive. But if somebody thinks that we can make a business out of this, definitely not possible because all this comes under strict wildlife act. Catching the snake, processing the snake, Keeping the venom or milking the venom from snakes, all are prohibited. So, if they come to know, there will be strict action taken by the forest department. So, it comes strictly under wildlife act. So, don't have to venture on this. You know, there are about 3,600 different species of snakes in the globe, of which about 375 species are venomous in the globe. In India, India being geographically versatile, there are about 300 different species of snakes, 
of which about 50 species are found to be venomous. That means to say non-venomous snakes outnumber venomous snakes. So whenever we encounter, whenever we come across a snake, that need not always be venomous. But never ever take a chance because they'll strike you again. That's most important. Don't try. So if you take the annual global burden of snake bite, according to WHO, World Health Organization 2017 report, about 5.4 million people are bitten by snakes. 5.4 million means about 54 lakh people are bitten by venomous snakes annually, of which about 2.7 million people express clinical symptoms. That means they are bitten by venomous snakes. Definitely, they need clinical intervention, medical intervention. Of these 2.7 million you know, victims, about 0.4 million, 0.4 million, that means about point, that is 4 lakh people suffer from permanent disability or disfigurement due to the development of very complex and complicated pathology at the site of birth. I mentioned in the beginning itself, first point, we try to understand the sustained tissue decay, the long-term tissue decay. So, because of the long-term tissue decay, about 0.4 million, you know, lose their, you know, affected limbs. So, 0.4 million getting affected. And after 2.7 million people who express clinical symptoms, about 0.15 million, that means about 1,50,000 people die annually worldwide. It's a huge number. So, but, India is the biggest contributor for this number. According to Suravira et al. 2020, about 58,000 people are believed to be killed in the Indian subcontinent alone. So, however, this number could be an underestimation of the reality as most of the cases occur in rural, remote and deep pockets and they never get into hospital records. Okay? So, that means to say, so 58,000 people that are dying annually in India alone means India alone is contributing to the extent of 35 to 40 percent of the global burden. That is the reason why many people would say India is the hot spot of snake bite, or uh, the snake bite capital of the world. That's what people say. You know, venomous snakes causes a pair of venom glands. You can see in the red ones. I have marked in the red ones pair of venom glands, which are the modified salivary glands actually, connected to a pair of modified teeth. This is a pair of modified teeth called fangs. During envenomation, the venom glands and the fangs, venom gland and the fangs, work like syringe. They push the venom into the prey or human victims through, through a hollow space in the middle. You can see over here, the red one, a hollow space there. So the peers, they inject the venom through a hollow space over there. The question is, why venom for snakes? Snakes use venom for two important purposes. Number one is for prey predation. That is in the process of prey acquisition. Snakes use their venom to immobilize, to kill, and to digest the prey. Secondly, whenever snakes are in danger or in threat, they use their venom as a defensive armament to defend themselves against their enemies or against their predators. You can see over here, the tiny creature, spitting cobra, tries to defend itself against a huge structure, an elephant that I've proud of, that I've removed, by spitting its toxic venom. Okay? Now, let me define snake venom. Actually, it's an inconvenient thing for me. Always I'll come over there. I just move around and speak. So, if you want to get the podium, it's like reading. I never does this. I am free of whatever comes to my mind. I just I just see other things and try to explain. But if anything happens, please excuse me. So, it's okay. I'm a pointer back. Of course, it's a pointer back. So, let me define snake venom. Snake venom is like complex mixture of enzymatic and non-enzymatic protein and peptide toxins. Interestingly and incredibly, most of the toxins are target specific. They do target vital organs, vital systems, such as nervous, muscular, and circulatory system. 
These are the important vital organs, vital system. And these, these three systems are tightly interconnected, interlinked, such that effect on one system invariably affect the other two. That means if you affect the nervous system seriously, muscular and circulatory systems are affected. If you affect muscular system, invariably circular and nervous systems are affected. Thus, snake bite is a true example of a simultaneous, a simultaneous lethal assault on vital organs and vital systems. Thus, snake bite is a true medical emergency. It's a true, very true medical emergency. See, venom, see, yellow one, and that's how the venom looks like, the, the life-related venom, the powdered or fish-like form of venom appears when you milk in the dry it will be like this. Okay? See, I, I mentioned two, uh, two terms. It's a complex mixture and target specificity. The two terms. Let me clarify those two. Complex mixture of target specific toxins. It's a totally a mixture of several toxins. Several toxins. And those toxins induce variety of pharmacological properties. Let's say you look at this. Edema, hemorrhage, neurotoxicity, myotoxicity, cardiotoxicity, hemotoxicity. The hemotoxicity predominantly affect blood coagulation, affect platelets function, affect the RBCs function. Nephrotoxicity, nephrotoxicity means affecting the kidney. Cytotoxicity, so irrespectively, the target all types of cells kill them. Hypotension, reduced you know, blood pressure. Hypoxia, I already mentioned hypoxia, reduced oxygen tension. Netosis. <coughs> In hypoxia and netosis, we discovered from more level. And tissue necrosis at the site of bite. Edema means swelling. Hemorrhage means oozing of blood. Neurotoxicity, nervous system is getting affected. Myotoxicity, muscles are getting affected. Cardiotoxicity, cardiac, the heart is getting affected. So we have toxins specifically targeting these target organs. So that means to say, venom is a mixture of very, very complex, complicated toxin. It is something like Yengar Bodhimge. Nam Yivagaste, you know, Ayu Puja Marti. Ayu Puja Nalina, Samane Marti, to, you know, Prasadana Anchilike, Bas Anchilike, Yer use Marti, Kadlepuri use Marti, Samane. Kadlepuri Tapatun there. It's a mixture of so many things. Puri is there. Headlay there, headlay is there, Kara Selge there, you know, Kara Bundir to there, Sea Bundir to there, then Kai Churvala to there. Well, it's a mixture of so many things, is it not? See, you isolate, you take one, Kadla Vizatakali, chew one body, it gives a what kind of taste. Puritakali, chew one body, it gives another kind of taste. Kadla, chew, gives a different kind of taste. Kopri, it gives a but Mix everything, mix them together. It is beyond your explanation. It is beyond that. You cannot explain. Akushina is exactly the same thing. We have individual toxins, but in the mixture, along with them, one reinforcing the other, it, it causes a complicated pathology. Depending on the dose of venom injected, it, it can decide. Whether a person is going to you know survive or is going to die in the absence of treatment. Okay, so this is what venom is a complex, complicated mixture of various toxins or target species. Most of them are target species. The second point I introduced was target specificity. What do you mean by a target? Target means, let's say, you just imagine a lock is there and a key is there. I've just shown two types of locks and two types of key. So a particular lock can be opened by that particular key only. And you, using this key, one key, you cannot open the other lock. Vice versa is also true. That means for a specific lock, we have a specific key. And lock is a actually target. Lock is called a target. And key is actually a messenger. It carries a signal. It carries a message. What signal I do I do other I do to you know lock it? Or if you open it, that's the signal. You have to lock or you have to open. That's the signal. So lock will have the levers 
and Q will have the grooves, corresponding grooves. They fit like this. They complementary to each other. I guess the levers and Q has a groove. Only this can fit, not this will fit. It's exactly the same. So when they fit like this, we can open. We can turn the levers. We can either lock or we can open. It's exactly the same way the target works, target specificity. A toxin, like toxin, let's say key is the toxin. And the target, let's say, cardiotoxin means the target is heart. Key is the, the toxin. It will straight away goes and affect on the cardiac movement. That's the target. So that, that's all. And another simple example. One more example. I think it's very familiar to everybody. Let's say insulin. Insulin is very well known. It's a hypoglycemic factor. Is it not? It reduces the blood glucose concentration. Insulin is produced by the beta cells of Langerhans of pancreas, is it not? So its function is to reduce the blood glucose levels, is it not? That is the signal. The insulin is a signaling molecule. What is the signal? Hypoglycemia, hypoglycemic signal is the signal. It's carried by the insulin. And where does it act? What are the targets? The major targets for insulin are your skeletal muscle and your adipose tissue. Skeletal muscle and adipose tissue are completely dependent on insulin for glucose uptake. Without insulin, these two tissues cannot ingest glucose. So, skeletal muscle and adipose tissue, they, the, they constitute the major volume of our body. Is it not? And those are the ones, if they start taking glucose, and those are the ones contributing for uptaking of blood glucose mainly. Is it not? So, Insulin is secreted by the pancreas and it carries a signal that is hypoglycemic signal and it acts on its target, targets of skeletal muscle and adipose tissue. Okay. And in response to insulin, skeletal muscle cells and adipose tissue cells imbibe uptake glucose. Let's say you want to meet our, let's say, vice chancellor. You know, let me answer, vice chancellor. And Vice Chancellor is your target, and you are bringing some signal. You want to invite him for some function, let's say. That is the message. You want to convey him. Is it not convey to him? It's something like that. So you want to meet Vice Chancellor, and the message is so you, are, you want to invite him for a function, but you do not directly enter Vice Chancellor's chamber, right? You cannot enter. Is it not? But what do you do? First, you report to the receptionist. Secretary and sends a signal to Vice Chancellor. So, in response to the signal, then Vice Chancellor will respond. Yes, you ask them to come in. This is how this is what insulin, although it acts on its target, it works through its receptor. It works through its receptor. So, here in, in the process of meeting Vice Chancellor, your secretary is the receptor for you. You go and lock into them. And receptor now is complex, will send the signal to the vice chancellor. Then you are allowed to go inside. This is what target specificity means. So interestingly, venoms are the depots of highly, highly target specific toxins. Now, for, for better clarity, better understanding, let me classify snake venom toxicity into two types. Number one is the systemic toxicity, number two is the local toxicity. Systemic toxicity is the toxicity experienced by the whole body, where the vital organs, vital systems, as I said before, are being targeted. This is highly, highly dangerous. In an untreated condition, this is fatal. People die because of this. You understand? Did you, did you follow what I said so far? And local toxicity. Local toxicity is the toxicity experienced at the site of bite, the bitten region. It is characterized by the edema, it's swelling, hemorrhage, oozing of blood, blistering, bubbling, ecchymosis, massive ecchymosis. You can see the change in color of the skin, color of the tissue over there. Is it not? And continued tissue destruction. You can see, you can, you can witness the complete tissue destruction. So these are characterized by the local toxicity. So what is the treatment for this? The treatment involves the intravenous infusion of the polyvalent antivenom, the only therapy available as of now to treat snake bite cases. If administered in time, the therapy can save the victims from the danger of death. 
otherwise you cannot see. So th there is a golden time for this. Golden time is the time gap in between the time of buy and time of start of the therapy. It's the golden time and the success rate of antivenom therapy of reciprocal regulation. If the golden time is shorter, the success rate of antivenom therapy is longer. If the golden time is longer, success rate is longer. It's, it's related like that. So, as soon as possible, if you administer antivenom, the success rate, the chances of survival of the victim is greater. That's what it means. Although antivenom can save the victims from the danger of fatal systemic toxicity, the unfortunately fails to neutralize the local toxicity. That means, even after administering the antivenom, even after the person is saved from the danger of death, in many of the snake bites, especially viper bites, the tissue decay at the site of bite would continue. As I said, it will continue for a couple of days, couple of weeks, couple of months, couple of years, lifelong infection. This is what. So that means to say the bottom line in this case is that we have some of treatment available for the systemic toxicity, but as of now, we have no treatment, no remedy is available for local toxicity. So these are the endemic snakes of the Indian subcontinent. Endemic means densely distributed or thickly distributed throughout a geographical area. That means in India, all these four snakes are densely distributed. They are the cobra, crate, reserve viper, and sasquatch. In the Indian subcontinent, the snake bite is generally attributed to bite by any of these four snake species. Therefore, these four are popularly referred as big four. Of the four, look at the, the two vipers, Brazil viper and Saskel viper, they are known to inflict devastating local toxicity. They are known to cause local toxicity, long-term tissue leak. Now, just to give you the gist of the impact of local toxicity, here I am presenting two case studies reported by this particular group, Chipaks, and this group from an African country. This is the first case report in which an 18 month old kid was bitten by a kiss Vosilata snake right in front of his parents while playing in front of his home. The kid was immediately taken to the hospital, dosed with antivenom. Fortunately, the kid is saved from the danger of death. But unfortunately, look at the local toxicity here, like this. So, in, within four days, it developed like this. It is the next stage. This is the next stage. This is after continuous 11 surgeries for 33 days follow, a group of doctors managed to treat this with skin graft. This was the final result. After this, what happened? Was this a permanent remedy? Was there a recurrence? Absolutely no idea. This is the first case report. And this is the second case report in which a 13 years old boy was bitten by suspected Echis vocilata snake while trying to catch a rat in a burrow. In this case, also, the boy got admitted, dosed with antivenom. Fortunately, he was saved from the danger of death. But unfortunately, look at the local toxicity over here. Look at the site of bite somewhere here. The bitten side, the entire limb is swollen. We have massive ecchymosis, we have blisters, you know, tissue decay, all those things are taking place. So, in order to release the pressure of the swollen limb, doctors made several incisions like this. Second day. And this was the next stage. This was the next stage. And this was the next stage. And this was the next stage. This was the next stage. So this has reached to this stage after 8 surgeries and 27 days. 27 days, they are alternate days, he underwent the surgery. Okay? And this has reached like, like this. So in order to prevent further tissue decay, there are no other options but to go for amputation of this leg. The worst ever therapy one can think of. Thus, it gives a sort of feeling in victims that, you know, Local toxicity, local toxicity is worse than the fatal systemic toxicity because so instead of dying bit by bit, let's say die once, that's the idea. Local toxicity, you are dying every day. Systemic toxicity, you are dying once. That's the reason why. The, that's the kind of psychology they, they develop. And in this case, this boy, what happened was 
when he got to know that his limb is going to be removed amputated it seems the boy disappeared from the hospital not only disappeared from the hospital he disappeared from the locality itself that's the kind of you know psychological trauma such psychological distress the patients undergo not only the patient will undergo the psychological trauma distress the family think of the family members and the entire family will be under distress it is definitely it's an important social problem it's an important social problem and also a national problem this is what local causes see in the indian subcontinent this tiny snake echis carinata that is saw scaled viper is also known to inflict a similar kind of devastating local tissue decay local toxicity at the site of bite now the question is why this persistent tissue decay that's long term tissue decay why no treatment available despite scientific advancement despite scientific advancement the treatment is not available because the molecular mechanism is not understood neither the remedy is available that's the reason okay if you understand the molecular mechanism probably it is easy to search the remedy for this so in this way different leading labs of the world been working since several decades maybe 1940s and 1950s pouring millions and millions of dollars even wh was of funded heavily on this project but at this stage i'm extremely happy and delighted to tell you the fact that our group made a major breakthrough towards understanding the molecular mechanism and also suggested a simple remedy for this so it's a huge story so we got this one published in you know a big journal uh, in nature communication actually if you look at the data the findings the discoveries made in this particular journal, you know paper it is beyond even nature right i instead of me if us person would have been there or european would have been there they would have made two nature made papers ultimate papers but probably because of lack of you know connectivity and also in india i could not make it so they themselves nature made suggested me to go for nature communication that's another journal so in the same you know line so it, it got to in nature communication it's, it's again it's a big journal very big journal it is difficult to publish so it's a huge story long length story the story so in order to make this long story short finally see what happens is the mechanism what we have proposed was at the site of bite with the bite here at the site of bite you know the venom can recruit you know blood cells especially white blood cells white blood cells are the sensitive cells for the foreign agent any foreign agent that gets into the system means the immediate responding cells are the white blood cells they are getting recruited over there see among the white blood cell neutrophils and vandriti cells but neutrophils are predominant they plant in number they get accumulated accumulate over there venom will act on them as a result the neutrophil will eject fiber like structure which is actually definitely a dna dna fibers are ejected through a process what we call netosis so venom will induce netosis strong netosis over there so here you can see how the net should be if you are not good you figure it see adu uh, red uh, part those are you know entangled by the nets those are the bacteria and this cotton like structures are the threads ejected by the neutrophils so the neutrophils eject which eject the, the, the dna threads as a result see depending on the extent of stimulation you get so much of the you know the nets release it could be like a cotton plug it can plug any blood vessel and prevent the blood flow that's what the mechanism you propose so when you block the blood flow so let's say there is a bite here the block here this part of the tissue suffer from starvation because blood will not be flowing there as a result what happens is this part of the tissue suffer from starvation blood is the one sup sup supply the nutrients and oxygen for all tissue and also transport back the the toxic waste material that are generated poly waste materials and also carbon dioxide is generated from the site of formation to the sites of disposal and that is getting in is it not there block there and as a result what happens is 
this part of the tissue will suffer from starvation. As a result, that means starvation, no nutrients, no oxygen, hypoxic state. That triggers a complicated pathology. See, how long this tissue can sustain without oxygen, without you know, nutrients? Can you guess anybody? Anybody can guess? A tissue without oxygen, without this one. Nutrients, how long they can sustain? It can sustain, say, we reason this way. Now, cornea transplantation, remember? Eye donation and the other. I cornea. Cornea, yes, I think maximum for years after that. Five, maybe six hours. You guys, research in improving maybe up to eight, eight hours, ten hours, we can. There's a you know, period for that. But otherwise, Without oxygen, without nutrient, this tissue can sustain for maybe maximum of five, five hours. So, if it exceeds five hours, obviously it's going to die. Irreparably, irreversibly, it's going to die. But within, let's say, five hours, if you, you know, allow the blood to flow, you can recover that. That's the idea. That's the, you know, hypothesis we propose. So, a key scan and venom induced, next, next black blood vessel, red blood flow. That's the reason why tissue decay happens. Can we treat this? So, again, we reason this way like, can we remove the block? So, after all, the blocks are the DNA threads. Is it not? Can we cut the DNA into pieces? Can we use DNA enzyme? That's what we did. We treated with DNAs. So, the DNAs dissolve the DNA threads allow the blood to flow. So this we have demonstrated in mouse models, preclinical study. Look at this. This is an ultimate wonderful study. See, look at this. This is the controlled mouse. The controlled mouse, you can see the clear you know, tail over there. The second one, it is kind of an injected mouse tail. After eight hours, it looks like that. It became black, hemorrhaging. It's black means almost already the tissue is dead. It's dead. Okay. Look at that. The first panel, one day, second day, fourth day, sixth day, ten days. See, already after eight hours, it is dead. The tissue is dead, it's gone. We call it for ten days. You see the last, you know, last of the tail, last of the limb. Look at the second panel. After three hours after venom injection, three hours after venom injection, we gave a DNA shot. We injected DNAs. Now look at that. Three hours later, we injected DNAs. Now look at that. Second day, fourth day, sixth day. Fourth day itself, the tail becomes long. Tail becomes. So that's how we rescued the tail. So it's clearly demonstrating that you know, in in local toxicity, one of the possible mechanisms is the, the netosis, nets formation, nets blocking of the blood vessel. As a result, tissue decay happens. If you remove the block, probably you can, you know, recover and, you know, save the limb. That's the discovery we made in our laboratory. And this is a fantastic discovery because even the DNAs that we are using here, the DNAs contain, the venom contain, some venoms contain DNAs. All these days, all big, big laboratories, they came to a conclusion that DNAs just perform a digestive role. If you take a prey, prey is made up of so many macromolecules. Proteins are there, lipids are there. Lipids are not macromolecules, proteins, nucleic acid, nucleic acid, DNA, RNA, then carbohydrate, they are all macromolecules. Is it not made up of all these things? And if so, in the food, we have carbohydrates, carbohydrate digesting enzymes take care of that, protein digesting enzymes, protein, they digest proteins, lipid digesting enzymes, they digest lipids, the nucleic acid, DNA, RNA digesting enzyme, they degrade. So, the digestive role. So, if at all, if the venom has the DNAs, means people thought all these years it is just as a digestive role because they've isolated DNAs from the venom and checked the toxicity. Even if they inject milligrams together, it was not toxic. That was the con so that's the reason why they concluded DNAs is non toxic and it just played a digestive role. But here we are demonstrating DNA is more than a digestive role, it has toxic role to play also. You can use this as a therapeutic agent. 
That, that's a huge story. If you ask question properly, I can explain. Okay, this we have published in Nature Communication. This is the main, the big paper. And uh, see, look at this. To just to assess the impact of this, you know, finding, uh, you can see over here. A few days, the third paragraph. A few days before publication, the NPG press office distributes a press release about upcoming Nature Communication papers. The last paragraph. I'm pleased to inform you that your paper has been selected for highlighting. So, from the Nature Publishing Group, we have plenty of Nature Publishing in the journals. And among all of them, they look for very outstanding contributions, outstanding publications. So, they pick the publications. And they themselves, they, if they feel that the publication is novel, the findings are novel, they go for press release. That's what they did. With respect to our you know, findings, they went for, you know, releasing the press note from their office. But we did not go into University of Mysore. University of Mysore could have gone for that, but we did not go. So, this got featured in so many journals, uh, daily journals, and even National Geographic. Featuring in National Geographic, probably it's bigger than publishing in other countries. So it's also got featured in National Geographic. See, all this time, I'm just telling you about, talking you about the ill effects, the cruel effects of venom, snake venom. Now let me go to the other face of the venoms or venomous organisms. So the, the beneficial effects, in a way. So as I already mentioned, venom is a mixture of target-specific toxins. They exhibit high degree of target specificity. So, because of the high degree of target specificity, you can call them as highly, highly target specific molecular bullets. If you want to aim a particular target, you can target it. If you want to target a heart, you can target the heart with using toxin. If you want to target the brain, you can use new neurotoxin. If you want to target muscle, you can use myotoxins. That's the target specific. So, because of the high degree of target specificity, venom toxins are used as tools in biology and medicine. As analytical tool, analytical tool means this is an academic interest. Analytical tool, you can use venom toxins to understand many, many complex and complicated, you know, physiology, which are otherwise difficult to follow, difficult to understand. This is what analytical tool, diagnostic tool in order to diagnose a lifestyle disorder or even a genetic disorder, you can use venom toxins. And because of the high degree of target specificity, they can be used as therapeutic agents. And they serve as prototypes on lead molecules to make better drug molecules. See, lead molecules and the end of the I'll come to that last minute. But before that, let me tell you. Lead molecules means, Movie noori kala ba, you know, na 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 na. Sang that kala ba, what is that movie? Aapta Mitra. In Aapta Mitra, if you take the final climax, uh, you know, yek Deva anta na yener kiva. And the final target is killing Vishnu. Ah, Indian Jan dalhi Vishnu ardhan ho Raja anta na to. Ye Jan dalhi Vishnu ardhan ho ro, you know, psychiatrist, is it not? But the target is a Devaka target to Vishnu Vardhan. But other lane Martha recommended Vishnu Vardhan now not Thorsi. A momentarily, your mind and the Devaka mind and the Berekata divert money, you know, Sambrani, Adi, Vaki, 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 create money. Vishnu Vardhan now Naka, Vogan Madi. A place only they keep the model, effigy of Vishnu Vardhan. This Vishnu Vardhan now, Vishnu Vardhan is not toxic. The prototype model is the that is a prototype. That's a model. Instead of Vishnu we have a model of that. That's what the prototype means. You can so since toxins are toxic, you cannot use them in many times directly. But because of the target specificity, you can use toxins to make drug molecules serving as prototypes or lead molecules to make drugs. That's the idea. You got it. See, in order to explain the venom toxins as analytical tools. Here I have taken the example of neurotransmission. So 
Atwa, some age related disorder. See, people are you know treating all these things because we have understood neurotransmissions quite better. Why we have understood is because of neurotoxins. Without neurotoxins, you can't even imagine understanding of neurotransmission. You can't even think of a remedy for neuronal disorders. So that's how neurotoxins play an important thing. I'm not even right. Neurotoxins are very, very crucial, very, very important. So that's neurotoxin serve as analytic tools. Second, diagnostic tools. Diagnostic tools are yeah? so important. See, uh, let's say hemostasis and power. Hemostasis uh, accompanies the, uh, the blood coagulation. Hemostasis is actually is an acute phase response to vascular injury. Acute phase response is a quick response to vascular injury. So if there is a damage of blood vessel, immediately what happens is the blood vessel platelets are formed. They get activated. They are to the damaged site over which clot forms are there. And platelets are there over which we have clot formation and seals of the damaged site. So as a result, minor hemorrhages are taken. There won't be any. Is it not? Is it, it is something like platelets go on the brick cagi, yellow damage I get the body. Platelets go on the itigari serve as you know bricks over which we have the cement. We have a clock, it's like a cement, a temporary wall is built. This it, it goes this, like this. So if you take a blood coagulation, there are different pathways. One pathway, what we call intrinsic pathway, another pathway, extrinsic pathway. They culminate at one point, from this point they, we have a common pathway. Final result is the same, whether you start from this or start from this, the final result is the same. They culminate both at the same point and it is like Kaveri Nadi. Lakshman Tirtha, Anirupan 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 so the final result, which of the pathway is activated on see various toxins. So I spoke from various you know venoms. They serve as you know help in understanding the neurotransmission better. So that's what. See here, I've shown like this. Hemostasis. So you don't pathway, other don't pathway, final like it, 5 present to 5 present to 10 present. Which of the pathway is activated? Final thing is activated. And end result is the formation of fibrin from 5 present. This is what? The clot. The fibrin is the clot. And the thing is that all the factors are their functioning is very variations. It's a cascade of events. One will act on the other, other will act on the other. It, it's a cascade of events. Finally, it comes to final end where it will act on fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is cleaved into fibrin. And the efficiency of fibrin clot formation depends on the efficiency and functioning of all the clotting factors. If there is a defect in any of the clotting factors, then you won't see the formation of final fibrin. Even minor injury will lead to a major damage. Minor injury due to in that case, let's say how to diagnose. How to diagnose there's a problem in the blood coagulation system. So in venoms, there are toxins specifically acting on specific steps. So using them, we can diagnose which which factor is actually deficient, which factor is actually a problem. So that you know the heart is not causing problem. So venom toxins can be used as diagnosis. Can diagnose lifestyle age related disorders and even you know the last one venom toxins are therapeutic tools. So here, because of the high degree of target specificity, you can use venom toxin directly as drugs sometimes, or you can use the those toxins as you know, tools or prototypes and lead molecules to make better treatments. As I said. As example of the molecule, which was unknown to me. So, all you need molecules. See, here I have taken the example of, let's say, hypertension. Hypertension is nothing but high blood pressure. Look at that. 
high blood pressure is popularly called the silent killer. High blood pressure, high BP is popularly called the silent killer because you know without your knowledge, your you know, vital organs that are richly supplied with fine capillaries are getting damaged. Let's say without your knowledge, they get damaged. Say for example, kidney. Kidney are supplied with fine capillaries because kidney is the one that filters the blood. Supplied with fine capillaries. Your cornea, eye, supplied with fine capillaries. Your brain, supplied with fine capillaries. So, high blood pressure only someone never affect the kidney. Blindness, brain hemorrhage, stroke, you know, you know, complication. This is not. So, in this case, that's the reason. Without your knowledge, you know, the organs get damaged. Before realizing kidney is down, that's the reason why. Uh, and, and, uh, hypertension is, is also popularly referred to as silent killer. So in this case, what happens is when there is a you know vasodilation, there is an enlargement of you know, blood vessel that is sensed by uh, kidney, heart, and arteries. Vasodilation means that is a low BP, low BP or hypotension, hypotension that is sensed by you know kidney in the kidney. Proreneum and thalmus, so that is converted into renin. It's an important fact. That renin is an enzyme that will convert C alpha to microglobulin or the angiotensin gel. That will act on them, convert that into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 that is responsible for increasing blood pressure to some extent. Angiotensin 1 is later converted into angiotensin 2 by Another enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme that is ASL tamatrilla, angiotensin converting enzyme that is predominantly you can see in lungs and kidneys. This enzyme converts angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 1 is less active, while angiotensin 2 is highly, highly active. It causes vasoconstriction. As a result, there is increased blood pressure. So, as a result, we have vasoconstriction. Hypertension. See, till 1970, there was no remedy. Till 1975, there was no remedy available to treat hypertension. Okay? See, nothing to the point. Just think. You want to go there? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. So, 1970, 1975, there was no remedy to control hyperhypertension. See, again, see, in 1975, actually, uh, this uh, Bristol Mayer's Squibb and the company, US company, it made a, uh, a medical you know, drug, what we call captropin. See, in the management of high blood pressure, which is the best target? Best target is actually angiotensin converting enzyme. This is the one, convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is the is responsible for high blood pressure. If you block the angiotensin 2 formation, then you are achieving the end result, achieving the goal. How to do that? At least you have to inhibit this enzyme. If you inhibit the angiotensin converting enzyme, achieving the goal, achieving the success. This is one. How do you inhibit? So here they have used an inhibitor, a drug molecule that can specifically target angiotensin converting enzyme. That ends that drug was caprophil. They are all derived from this. This is the parent molecule. From this, all derived, you know, varieties of pills are there for you know, controlling people. So this caprophil, you know. How they made? They made from an idea that is obtained from a toxin from Brazilian snake, Batra of Jaraka. Batra of Jaraka, 1940s and 50s, and 1947 actually, there was a national issue in Brazil. People used to die, many people used to die because of this snake bite. This snake bite, Sikamada Jana scientist, Government entrusted the task, they find out what could be the reason for this. Entrusted the task to this person. Very 